Hi Arandika, can you hear me? And is my screen visible? Um, all right, thanks. <clears throat> We'll wait for a couple of more minutes till more people hopefully join in the next. Let's wait for about five minutes. everyone have you been enjoying the course so far um any feedback um this is week four have you all been able to go through the lectures of week four Feel free to use the chat box or unmute yourself and talk. Has everyone gone through the lectures for week four? No. <laughs> what happened, uh, Samya? I think week five lectures are already out, right? So again, this is going to be an interactive session where feel free to ask doubts, questions, talk. Yeah, I think let's just give it a couple of more minutes. Uh, have you been enjoying the course so far? Has it is it is it been tough or easy?
medium okay medium okay what other what 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 parts do you find tough are there certain concepts that you find difficult or are the lectures too fast are the problem solving sessions like these that happen are they useful or not really Okay, I don't think we are going to have more people. So uh, let's start the tutorial <coughs> problem session, problem solving session for week four. Uh, first lecture. Uh, Neeraj, uh, are you saying that the first lecture was difficult or are you on the first lecture? Okay, all right. So, uh, welcome to. Okay, you're attending the first lecture. Okay, no problem, no problem. Yeah, uh, welcome to this NPTEL course on wildlife ecology. Uh, this is going to be the problem solving session for week four. I am Chiti Arvind, your uh, one of the three course TAs for the wildlife ecology course, and I'm a PhD student at ISER Tirupati. So the session is already starting to rec uh, has been uh, recording. So let's go to the first question. So the first few lectures, I mean, this particular week's lectures is on uh, food chains and um, the food web. So tell me which of the following organisms is an omnivore? Is it a squirrel? Is it a cow? Is it a leopard? Or is it a rhinoceros? You can uh, type in your correct answers in the chat box. And since there are how many of you? Very few of you. I would like all of you to reply. So please use the chat box and choose your correct answer. Which of the following organisms is an omnivore? Okay, first tell me what do you understand by an omnivore? Does anyone know what is an omnivore? Man, uh, okay, so an omnivore is an organism that eats everything. Okay, so um, um, what, which animal out here falls under the category of omnivore? Is it a squirrel? Is it a cow? Is it a leopard? Or is it a rhinoceros? Don't worry about uh, choosing the right or wrong answer. Uh, we will surely be discussing this. But uh, please put in your answers in the chat box. What do you feel if you had to take a guess? Okay, Neeraj says D. What about the rest of you? Amrita Varshini says A. Soumya says A. What about the rest? Okay. Sanvika says A. What about the rest of you? What do you feel? Ayantika and uh, Venkata, Vamsi.
Okay, so the so E is the correct answer. The squirrel is an omnivore. What about uh, the cow? What is a cow? It's a herbivore. Yeah. What about the leopard? All right. Yeah. So good. Please use the chat box and have some interaction going. Uh, the squirrel is an omnivore out here. Your cow and rhino are the herbivores, and your leopard is a carnivore. All right. Let's move on to the next question. So, Nitrobacter, Nitrosomonas, and Methanophiles are examples of autotrophs, photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, or herbivores. What is the correct answer here? Okay, two answers for C. What about the others? What do you feel? If you don't know, please also do type in the chat box that you don't know. Okay, all right, uh, would someone like, to, okay, so the correct answer is C, chemoautotrophs, would someone like to explain what are chemoautotrophs? So you have to, so as uh, Amrita Varshani has mentioned, uh, that is correct. Uh, chemoautotrophs are a form of autotrophs that use chemicals to synthesize uh, food. And uh, what are the other kind of autotrophs? It's already listed out here. So there are two kinds of autotrophs. So you have chemoautotrophs and you have photoautotrophs, right? Correct. So yes, so Samya, you are right. Yeah, photoautotrophs, they use light source as their uh, primary uh, source to generate energy. Right, so they are able to make their own food via chemicals or and light scores. And uh, examples of chemoautotrophs are uh, given out here, and other photoautotrophs are your plants, etc., that use the process of photosynthesis to generate food. Okay, so the following organism breaks down dead decaying organic matter into small molecules. What is it called? Is it, uh, I mean, uh, which of the following organisms can do that? Is it a crab? Is it a vulture? Is it an earthworm? Or is it a rabbit? Okay, lot of people for C. Someone have a question? I guess not. Okay. Okay. So, yes, uh, that is the correct answer. It is indeed uh, the earthworm. Um, why is it not a vulture? What is a vulture? Correct. 
Correct. Vulture is a scavenger. And what is the difference between a, a scavenger and an earthworm? Well, a uh, scavenger does not does feed on uh, dead matter, but it does not break it down into small molecules, right? Unlike an earthworm. All right. So, uh, with respect to ecological pyramids of numbers and biomass in terrestrial and marine ecosystems, which of the following options is correct? The marine biomass pyramid is inverted and the terrestrial, num bio terrestrial number pyramid is inverted. Terrestrial and marine biomass pyramid is upright. Terrestrial biomass pyramid is upright and marine biomass pyramid is inverted. Terrestrial number pyramid is upright and terrestrial biomass pyramid is inverted. Which is the correct answer? Think about it a little bit. Do you all understand what is a pyramid of biomass and numbers? Yes, no. Would someone like to explain what is a pyramid of biomass and a pyramid of numbers? Somebody? Nobody? No idea? Some idea? Um, I'm just guessing it from the terms. Uh, my uh, numbers could probably indicate the population. Okay. Biomass could be the total mass of the organisms. Okay. Okay. So keep if you take that as a standard or as an understanding, which do you feel is the correct answer? You are on the right track. So when you say numbers, you are talking about count. And when you are dealing with biomass, it's about yeah mass as in terms of biomass. I think uh, Samya has replied to this question as B is the correct answer. What do the rest of you feel? No, nobody, any answers?
Okay, so just based on the fact of numbers and biomass, what do you feel? Uh, so marine biomass pyramid is inverted and terrestrial number pyramid is inverted. Do you, do you understand what it means by upright and inverted? So when you say upright, it means that the largest number is at the base and, and you go from uh, producer, consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, etc. Right? Now does that give you any hints as to when we talk about uh, biomass pyramid of numbers or pyramid of uh, terrestrial biomass and numbers, does that give any hints? Um, is the biomass pyramid inverted? Yes, yes it is. So taking that as a hint, what do you think is the correct answer? Okay, so I'm going to say C. Okay, okay, rest of you, what do you feel? Okay, so yes, C is the correct answer. So you have the terrestrial biomass pyramid, which is upright which means that everything like all the primary consumers have the largest quantity of biomass which is all your vegetative uh, vegetation right and your secondary biomass has uh, i mean your uh, not secondary biomass your marine biomass pyramid is always inverted because you have plankton and primary consumers that are very less in uh, uh, mass so uh, that's why as you go higher up the food chain the biomass increases like for example whales for example are at the topmost chain but they are uh, very few in number so in a numbers pyramid it's upright but when you take a biomass pyramid it's inverted right is that clear the uh, concept why let's go to the next question then Okay, what kind of ecological pyramid is always upright? Is it a number pyramid? Is it an energy pyramid? Is it a biomass pyramid? Or is it a number and energy? Alright, so I think we were on this question. I hope the screen is visible. Um, so what kind of ecological pyramid is always upright? Is it a number pyramid? Is it an energy pyramid? Is it a biomass pyramid? Or is it a number and energy pyramid? Okay. Okay. Okay, so interesting. We have a mix of answers that are going between B and D. Alright. So, uh, I think everybody unanimously agrees that an energy pyramid is always uh, upright. Right? Because a greater source of energy is always at the primary source and your uh, next uh, as you go higher up the food chain the amount of energy decreases right because there's always some loss in energy so uh, uh, what about a pyramid of numbers why do you think a pyramid of numbers is always upright 
and for those who answered b why do you think it is not upright could you give me an example the producers are greater in number hence the per number pyramid is upright okay okay yeah so in a tree ecosystem yeah the number is inverted and why is that because because in the tree ecosystem you can have just one tree supporting a number of uh, uh, consumers right so in that case your number pyramid is inverted because uh, the bottom most producer level will have only one and as you and as the tree is able to support like a uh, multiple number of organisms on it it could be insects it could be um birds it could be mammals etc the number of primary and secondary consumers is much larger than the producer numbers itself so that's correct okay so in the figure given alongside what does it actually depict does it depict a food network a food web a food connection or a food chain apart from ayantika and somya what did the others feel so tell me what is the difference between a food web and a food chain anybody what is the difference between a food chain and a food web linear wide food web has multiple integrated right that's correct so a food chain is a linear uh, connection between your primary uh, producer to your consumers etc and then when you have an interaction of uh, food um chains that can be put together you have a network known as like a food web it's not called a food network it's called a food web right so it's basically an interconnected network of different food chains that are all interrelated so in the diagram given alongside you can see that uh there are uh three primary producers which are right at the bottom and uh, then you have a number of herbivores that feed on these uh uh primary producers and then if you can see the phytoplankton is consumed by 
some primary consumers directly it's consumed by herbivores directly and then your uh, small planktivorous fish are consumed by multiple secondary consumers right so it's not a linear food chain it's a network all right so can you give me examples of food chains that you see around you or you know of either in your home or in your surroundings or anything that you have read about could do all give me some examples of uh, food chains feel free to unmute or use a chat box No, nobody has seen any food chains or food webs around you in your homes. I think if I give you an example, all of you would have probably seen it. Okay, what are the kinds of uh, interactions that you see in your house in terms of any step of the food chain? kitchen waste earthworms and human okay thanks somya that's a good one um afifa afi afia sorry says grass grasshopper frog snake eagle yeah that's like the classic example of food chain that uh, you see in your textbooks what else that's actually quite a nice example somya and the grass grasshopper frog snake eagle is the classic example of a uh, primary producer primary consumer second then primary consumer secondary consumer and tertiary consumer anybody else no no other interactions do you see in your house okay forget the food chain but at least any step any couple of steps no no interactions happening in your house between any organisms do you not see any organisms in your house yeah see insects and insects eaten by lizards sure that's one thing you definitely would see right then uh, what do these insects feed on like for example flies i'm sure you have seen flies sitting on food waste on nutrients they are sucking in some nutrients from food waste and these are eaten by lizards then even flies sitting on food waste and then getting caught in spider webs have you seen that plankton fish human sure that is another example fish that eat plankton and then finally eaten by humans fish that eat plankton and then bigger fish that eat those fish that eat plankton and then finally going to humans 
so yes there are like several several examples of like food chains right that can be prevalent and present around you sometimes uh, we just need to observe all right a uh, type of food chain where dead producers are broken down by microorganisms are no, is known as uh, is it a predatory food chain parasitic food chain detritus food chain or a consumer food chain what kind of food chain is it anyone no one okay c c okay okay all right so that is the correct answer it is indeed a detritus food chain um and um, these what happens with the detritus food chain it is a very important food chain right because if you have so much dead decaying matter that is not being decomposed there will be a lot of putrefaction in the environment right so you need to have these detritic uh organisms that can break down these dead decay organic matter and re- and return it into like soil for example right okay so in the given food chain which is a classic example of grass grasshopper lizard snake and instead of eagle we have a mongoose here the mongoose has about for a 0.45 kilojoules of available energy so please let me calculate and tell me what will be the available energy for the autotrophs so tell me here what are the autotrophs Okay, Samya says D. Okay, yes, grass is the autotroph. Correct. So, how much of energy is available for the autotrophs? So, this is the energy consumed by the autotrophs. two people i think said d okay one more answer for d This is B.
okay b okay so i'm seeing a lot of answers for b and d all right so now if we go like few steps back so now count the number of so i think uh, how much of energy is uh, passed on from one uh, trophic level to another could you give me a percent 10% that's correct and so how many steps do you have out here so right from energy available to grass transferred from grass to grasshopper grasshopper to lizard lizard to snake snake to mongoose of yes is 4 so we are talking about the energy source for the autotrophs not the energy source from the autotrophs so if you count that energy source available to grass itself it will have it will have five steps right energy from the sun to grass grass to grasshopper that is 2 grasshopper to lizard 3 lizard to snake 4 snake to mongoose 5 yeah correct so it's actually five levels and d will be your correct answer okay as you multiply it by 10 to the power of 5 All right. So moving to the next question. So a trophic cascade can be defined as an ecological phenomena triggered by the addition of top predators, the removal of top predators, the addition and removal of top predators, or the addition and removal of top predators along with a few primary consumers. so can someone does everybody understand what is a trophic cascade yes no Okay. Okay. So two people say C and. two people okay so now in the picture given alongside uh, could you tell me what is a trophic cascade out here मोस्ट फेमस एग्जाम्पल ऑफ अ ट्रोफिक कैस्केट इज सीन बाय दी so uh, is seen in the um, yellowstone national park by the addition and removal of wolves have are all of you familiar with this example yes no yes okay i'm not sure if uh, all of you have seen this video before I am just going to play it. I'm also going to add the link here, but I would like all of you to watch this and then we can also discuss. One of the most exciting
exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. The, the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. All right. So all of you hopefully have been able to see the video. So does anyone have any comments or anyone like to share some thoughts and feedback? I mean, the video was on how uh, wolves were able to change the course of rivers, right? Do you believe this? Do you not believe this? Would you like to add some comments or interesting things that you noticed as a part of this video? Do you think it's possible? I mean, do you believe all of this?
Top predator removal causes overpopulation of water bug in Gor Gorgonza National Park. Uh, where is this uh, Afya, the Gorgonza National Park? In Mozambique, okay. And uh, what is the top predator out here? Lions, okay. All right. So that is another example of a trophic cascade, right? So in the case of this particular video that you see uh, of the wolves at Yellowstone National Park, how long do you think it would have taken for these uh, rivers to stabilize? Do you think it was like uh, it's a, it was a slow process or was it a fast process? Anyone? Slow process or fast process? Gradual. Okay. Um, so, are wolves directly linked to rivers? Yes, no. Not directly, okay. Can you give the uh, example <clears throat> of an organism that was also featured in this video that can is directly interacting with the river ecosystem? and can alter it it was shown in the video it's an organism that interacts with rivers and can alter it yeah correct beavers so what do beavers do What do beavers do? Well, it was in the video. What did you see that beavers were doing in the video? What, what was it shown? What ecological function do they have? Nobody knows what beavers do? Amrita Varshani is correct in that beavers closely interact with, uh, da uh, with rivers. It took tree branches in water. Yes, that is correct. It changed the course of flow of water. Yes. So what are beavers known as? They are known as uh, uh, keystone species and they are also known as uh, ecological engineers, right? Because they construct dams 
and uh, because they bring these uh, pieces of wood floating around and they create these uh, blockages in the river they are able to you know uh, hold up a pool of water in some areas while allowing uh, the overflow water to get out right so they build dams as uh, the word suggests and uh, when they build these dams over the course of the rivers at multiple areas they stop the flow of the river and certain organisms prefer feeding in uh, stagnant or still water they are on the this side of the dam and the other organisms are the are on the other side because that suits their foraging habits better so beavers directly do interact with rivers and are important ecological in indicators now the presence of beavers in yellowstone national park increased because of the cascading effects of uh, the wolves and uh, because the beavers number increased in this particular area they resulted in a lot of downstream ecological uh, benefits to the ecosystem and then this downstream cascade you know ended up um, uh, changing the course of the rivers and reinforcing it over several hundreds of years and these particular uh, and these particular uh, word uh, rivers were fixed into place because the vegetation had grown strong around it and uh, allowed the soil to you know get fixed so these strengthened the river banks and uh, shaped the course of the rivers ultimately so there you have how a top keystone uh, species like your uh, um you know uh, wolves can uh, completely change the uh, ecosystem itself so yeah that is a slow process also all right Oops. okay so the rate of biomass production is termed as uh, productivity decomposition respiration photosynthesis Okay, two people says productivity. What about the others? What do you feel? Biomass production is termed as Nobody has any guesses?
okay so samya and afia you are correct uh, it is known as uh, productivity indeed okay so uh, tell me what does compensation point mean in the plant cycle and how many compensation points are there in a day anybody okay so i think the illustration is clear there are two uh so can someone please explain what is compensation point J or just explain this graph what do you understand by this graph okay that's correct afia where this is the point at which your photosynthesis rate is equal to the respiration rate it's d none of the above okay so how many compensation points are there samaya <laughs> it's again me okay solid is okay no problem okay so uh, let's discuss this uh, graph a little bit so this is a uh, 24 hours of a day represented in your graph on the x axis you have time of the day from 0 to 24 hours well 0 is technically the 24 hour and then you have on your y axis carbohydrate balance which is basically grams per hour okay and then you have a particular uh, a plant undergoes um, or performs the function of respiration and photosynthesis right so you have a plant that is respiring throughout the day okay plants have undergo the process of respiration because they breathe so they are undergoing respiration throughout the day but photosynthesis only happens at some point of time in the day why is that why is there a discrepancy in uh, both these uh, activities can anyone tell me correct exactly right uh because of sunlight so we yes exactly so for for, for the process of photosynthesis we need sunlight and uh, 
the presence of sunlight happens during the day so the photosynthesis the process of photosynthesis starts during sunrise and finishes by sunset so that's almost uh, you have good sunlight by around 6 30 in the morning till about 5 30 in the evening so now this compensation point is the point at which the rate of uh, respiration is equal to the rate of photosynthesis so that means the amount of uh, carbon sequestered is equal to the amount of carbon uh, that is um, lost right or due to breakdown of carbon due, due to the process of respiration and uh, at this particular point you will have the compensation point so there are two points where this happens and this happens at during the day in the morning where the uh, rate of photosynthesis exceeds the rate of uh, respiration and in the evening when your rate of photosynthesis decreases from the rate of respiration right so there are two points where they intersect each other and this is known as your compensation point I hope this is clear to everyone. Right? So your compensation is the equilibrium point where photosynthesis equals the respiration. And what I also mentioned exactly the same thing is uh, carbon dioxide is fixed in the process of photosynthesis. Right? But in the process of respiration, your carbon dioxide is getting released, right? Because that's what happens when we respire, we break down energy and that is lost in the form of carbon dioxide and water vapor, right? So when your amount of carbon fixation is equal to the amount of carbon release, it is termed as the compensation point. Hope this is clear. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so we have Lake Kahitilian. It's a small, shallow, subtropical lake located in the Endor. Endor Hake Basin in Western Mexico. It is characterized by strong seasonality of climate with pronounced wet and dry seasons and has been classified as a dash lake. So a uh, part of this excerpt says that this particular condition was driven by improperly treated sewage discharges from four municipal wastewater plant treatments and by excessive agricultural activities including the overuse of fertilizers that reach the lake through surface runoff during the rainy season. This nutrient rich runoff has caused algal blooms which have led to anoxic or hypoxic conditions resulting in large scale fish deaths that have occurred during or immediately after the rainy season. So what kind of lake is this? termed as is it a eutrophic lake is it an oligotrophic lake is it a hyper eutrophic lake or is it a mesotrophic lake
sorry i don't know what is happening with my network it's just dropping um i hope you can see the screen uh, i have lost again chat history so please let me know if uh, could you please type your answers again about this type of lake Uh, is it a eutrophic lake? Is an is it an oligotrophic lake? Is it a hypoeutrophic lake or a mesotrophic lake? Okay, one answer for C. Uh, another answer for C. What about the others? What do you feel? nobody else has any idea what kind of lake this could be so the giveaway is given in the description below right so it's talking about uh, the condition driven by sewage discharges and uh, because of overuse of fertilizers nutrient rich runoff hypoxic conditions or anoxic conditions Does someone have a question? Yeah, okay. So a lot of people have said C and a lot of uh, Samya says A. Okay. So, uh, so the correct answer is actually C out here. But uh, can you tell me what is the difference between a eutrophic lake and a hyper eutrophic lake? Any ideas? Ma'am, uh, a hyper eutrophic lake also displays algal blooms due to uh, runoffs, but then a uh, eutrophic lake. Will only have a uh, lack of oxygen condition. So, are you saying eutrophic lake will not have alkyl blooms? Uh, Mama, I think it will have alkyl blooms. Okay, so, uh, so, you, so if I understand right, you are saying that um, eutrophic lakes will have only hypoxic conditions but not algal blooms but hypoeutrophic lakes will have algal blooms and hypoxic conditions i'm not sure if i got that right uh, yes ma'am that's my understanding okay okay all right so basically you have uh, so actually it's the flip of that amrita vashini uh, you have eutrophic lakes that have algal blooms, but the algal blooms are not to such a high extension as in hypereutrophic lakes. So hypereutrophic, as the name itself suggests, means that it is a magnified version of eutrophic lakes where it is extremely nutrient rich and you have severe algal blooms that are happening happening out here and your algal blooms in uh, eutrophic lakes are high but they are not so high to cause hypoxic conditions in a hypoeutrophic lake there is just a complete scarcity of oxygen and it leads leads to uh, large scale deaths so in this condition that is described in this lake out here in Mexico, uh, hypereutrophic 
lakes is the correct answer but uh, i think the giveaway is um your uh, hypoxic conditions and uh, uh, leading to like dead zones uh, beneath the surface of the lake so yeah so that that is a characteristic of a hypoeutrophic lake madam madam my small doubt ma'am yeah go ahead when when all gay is there they release oxygen na to photosynthesis right the anoxygenic condition comes yeah because they release water due to photosynthesis i uh, release uh, oxygen due to photosynthesis into the atmosphere not into the water okay. so the amount of dissolved oxygen ha ha they release the dissolved oxygen also yeah? no they don't it goes more into the atmosphere rather than into the fixation into the water does not happen good question though okay Uh, what about the microbes ma'am uh, what about the microbe population in uh, such condition i would assume that the uh, aerobic microbial uh, population will decline and i don't know about microbes that may be able to survive in uh, hypoxic conditions i am not sure but uh, there might be certain microbes that are able to i guess there might be amplification of microbes that are able to survive in uh, low oxygen content or maybe chemoautotrophs also some that are able to just fix um, uh, these new any of these nutrients or uh, uh, chemicals that are uh, dissolved in the water Okay, 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 ma'am. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, uh, good question though. I mean, it might be worth just putting it on the discussion forum also for further. Yeah. All right. So you have uh, something known as the uh, Secchi disk, and the Secchi depth is found out by estimating the depth where. the black and white colors on this particular sechi disk are the clearest the entire disk appears black the black color of the disk is not seen and the or the black and white part of the disk are not seen so what is the sechi depth and what's the co- correct answer there is a diagram also alongside what so what do you feel is the correct answer okay one two answers for d d okay navin says c okay so it the correct answer is uh, d where you find the black and white part of the disk that is not visible and uh, what happens is that uh, light penetration is very very uh, high 
when you have a low algal count that's because there is less turbidity and uh, in the case of high turbidity with high percentage of algal count you have uh, low visibility and this is uh, this makes the disc not visible as you insert it down to greater depths so d is the correct answer okay so which of the following equations is correct npp is equal to gpp minus r npp is equal to gpp plus r r is equal to npp into gpp gpp is equal to r minus npp also can you give me uh, the full forms of these terms net primary productivity okay non primary productivity and respiration correct. respiration correct so a is correct ma'am okay okay uh, so couple of answers for a one for b okay all right so yes that is the correct answer net primary productivity is equal to gross primary productivity minus respiration all right so which of the following essential elements is found in the currency of your cells so now we are move to the uh, nutrient part is it manganese is it phosphorus is it nickel is it magnesium phosphorus ma'am okay. it is atp okay uh, shrinivas feels it is uh, b phosphorus okay so uh, yes indeed uh, atp is the uh, currency of the cell as uh, could someone give me the full form of atp for those who don't know or are not from a biology background it will be nice to explain to them so what is atp okay adenosine triphosphate and uh, where is this produced mitochondria okay so our cells have multiple organelles one of these organelles is known as a mitochondria which is known as the energy powerhouse of the cell that actually produces it, uh, energy and this energy is produced in the form of atp which is also abbreviated as adenosine triphosphate all right so this particular element is important for cell division as and is an integral part of the cell wall uh, so could you give me some example calcium ma'am okay because uh, there is uh, pectin material is always bind with bind with the calcium calcium pectin okay okay uh so one answer for calcium what about the others what do you feel
okay so yes calcium is the correct answer uh, so choose the correct set of elements that describe an accurate set of micronutrients for the plant is it selenium sulfur silicon sodium boron selenium molybdenum vanadium phosphorus zinc silicon aluminium or iron cobalt chlorine magnesium answers for B okay so yeah that is the correct answer actually b um it is boron selenium molybdenum and vanadium uh could somebody tell me what are uh, micronutrients and macronutrients Okay, micronutrients are required in small amounts and uh, macronutrients are, in, uh, are required in large amounts. Could you list out uh, the macronutrients that are important for plants? Name some macronutrients. Okay, nitrogen, I no. phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, calcium, calcium is not a carbon hydrogen oxygen, carbon hydrogen oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Carbon, uh, I don't. Magnesium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So NPK. Magne yeah. Magnesium, sulfur, and uh, calcium. Calcium also. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, the most abundant source of nitrogen on our planet is found in the soil, the atmosphere, in the ocean or in plants. Okay, one answer for B. B only ma'am. B. 78% of nitrogen is present in it. Okay. Okay, so that is uh, right. Okay, so uh, rhizobium is a form of bacteria that helps in the nitrogen cycle for which of these following processes? Is it assimilation, synthesis, denitrification or fixation? Uh, Ambreen, do you have a question? Fixation, ma'am. Defixation. Okay. Thanks, Srinivasa. Uh, Ambreen, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if that's an accident. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. Answer, 
Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Thanks. Okay, so everybody has uh, is fixed on fixation. So can someone explain this process to me? The process of fixation, how does this happen? Okay. Yeah. So here is a little bit of a diagrammatic representation of what uh, Srinivasa just explained. So you have uh, atmospheric nitrogen in the form of like free nitrogen. It is fixed in these uh, uh, root nodules of nitrogen uh, consisting of nitrogen fixing bacteria in uh, plants. Could you give me some the names of some plants that do have nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules? What's the most popular example? Leguminous plants. Yes, that's correct. Uh, leguminous plants, indeed. And um, uh, why are uh, leguminous plants important to us? So, in uh, farming, have has anybody heard of the concept of crop rotation? Okay, Tusha says enriched soil. Yeah, uh, yes, Amrin, you wanted to say something? Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, to enrich soil for rice cultivation that need nitrogen. Yeah, that's correct. So, if we, so what is the process of growing only one type of crop called? Monoculture. Correct. Right. So monoculture means you are continuously growing only one crop type. And why is that bad? Yes, yeah, something. Yeah. Only the same, the same nutrients are being utilized by the uh, plant. Right. And uh, if it's the same, yeah. It gets deficient in the same or the same nutrient which is almost used by the plant all the time. Correct. And that's why what should we be doing? Alternate farming. Right. So when you do a uh, uh, crop rotation or yeah, um, having different kinds of crops, you grow them in a fashion that they, uh, the next crop that you grow is able to replace the nutrients that have been taken by the previous crop. And then you re return your soil to an ideal health. In the current world and scenario, uh, crop rotation is something that uh, is not practiced because of the presence of Why is monoculture so <laughs> demand? Yes, correct. Sure. Very high demand. Fertilizers, that's right. Correct. Like that's how we managed to have monocultures. Because we have external sources of, uh, for example, of using fertilizers by which we can supplement the soil by lost nutrients. But in the long term, we all know that this is not good because there are several uh, downstream effects of using uh, fertilizers and different ways of uh, yeah, soil enrichment that are not uh, organic. So let's go to the next question. 
okay so you have the water cycle that consists of which of the following steps it consists of precipitation fixation runoff does it consist of percolation transpiration consumption decomposition assimilation evaporation or evaporation condensation precipitation okay what do uh, others feel about this Okay, so yes, indeed D is the correct answer. Your water cycle consists of these three steps, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Okay, so uh, this is yeah, the last uh, question actually for the day. Uh, this is uh, known as the Oswald process and it is one of the most common methods or chemical processes used for the manufacturing of any idea so both these processes are uh, quite famous and contribute towards a particular element cycle okay uh, right so it is actually yes uh, nitric acid and uh, which is the other process that takes nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and combines it to form ammonia with hydrogen what is this process called No, this is forming ammonia gas. It's uh, not fixing the ammonia. Uh, no, uh, not that. Ammonification. Okay, it's it's like the Oswald process. It's also called a particular process. Sorry, I keep dropping in and out. I think there are some serious Wi-Fi issues. Uh, am I bad? Hello? Hello, hello. Is the screen back? Am I back? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so this is this process is actually called the Haber's process, H A B E R Haber process, which takes nitrogen gas from the atmosphere. All right, thanks, Srinivasa. Um, yeah, so the process is called Haber's process, and the Oswald process is the process of manufacturing uh, nitric acid. Has this again dropped? Uh, I 
I'm not sure about the connectivity, Srinivasa. Am, am I audible or not really? This is microbes, uh, that is um, uh, the, so that is iron molybdenum complex. Am I back? Sorry, this is very troublesome. Yeah, All right. Uh, I missed out on the conversation. Uh, okay, Amreen has a question. I missed the first three week assignment and it's closed now. Can something be done? Oh, I have no idea about uh, the um, functioning of NPTEL. So, um, it might be good to post this on the discussion forum and NPTEL will get back to you because uh, the TAs are not involved in any of the back end of the program itself. Uh, but uh, it might be worth just dropping in a message on the discussion forum and also you can write to NPTEL. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding any of the previous modules or any particular concepts that were difficult to understand or tricky or that you would like more explanation on? No, no questions, no doubts. Everything has been clear over the past four weeks. I'm not sure if I'm audible. I'm just going to type. Oh, I am audible. Thanks, Tuisha. <laughs> I'm still going to just finish that. Any doubts from lectures over the past uh, four weeks? Would you like any concepts to be covered more in detail? Nothing? Everything is clear? Everything is easy? No? Okay, so I guess uh, we can all meet uh, next week for week 5 and uh, yeah, I will be I will be back again on Tuesday, not Monday so we had to, I will be there for next Tuesday's class Alright, uh, thanks for joining in today all those who have joined today and uh, we shall meet next next week yeah, thanks Amrita. Alright, uh, also if you do have any uh, doubts or any uh, suggestions, please feel free to voice them or any particular concepts that you would like to be covered because uh, 
this uh, session is going to be these sessions are for clearing your doubts or um, uh, you know solving any difficulties that you have during the course so yeah all right catch you all next week bye